In this appendix, we look at how to plot the pursuer and target engagement for the script that was reviewed in Appendix A. Recall that that script produced range versus time, line of sight rate versus time, closing velocity, acceleration, and the trajectory of the pursuer and target. In the Missile Guidance Fundamental Short Course, you'll also recall various animations. This appendix will cover how to create animations of the engagement and how to make them into video files for later playback. We'll first review the basic engagement data plotted at the end of the script. For this, let's review what the script produces. So we had our input data, and all of that really was to create an initial condition vector that was comprised of the initial target heading angle, the pursuer and target positions, and the pursuer and target velocities. That initial condition was integrated forward with the fourth order Rungakutta, and the Enlin pronav underscore sim contained the kinematics and pronav. So at the end of this integration, we have the state vector which has nine states and 1,200 points in time. So how do we get to line of sight rate, closing velocity, all of this other data of interest when our simulation result is in terms of positions, velocities, target heading angle? Well, we need to plug in the state data to the formulas for closing velocity, line of sight rate, etc. So for this, I first make pointers to the states just to make sure I know what I'm selecting out of the Y vector. Then we determine the relative position and relative velocity as well as the range because these are the input to the line of sight rate as you can see here as well as the line of sight angle. Closing velocity also depends on the relative quantities. With line of sight rate and closing velocity, we can input that data to reproduce the true pronav acceleration command over the course of the engagement. Or if pure pronav is selected, then line of sight rate and missile velocity can be input into the second conditional here for that acceleration command history. Once we've post-processed the state data, we're ready to visualize it, whether it be a static plot or an animation. Often we want to plot up to the miss distance. To do this, we determine the miss index. That's the index in time where the pursuer and target are closest in the simulation. Now with the miss index, we proceed to the first plot, which is a plot of the trajectory of pursuer and target. So you'll see actually four plot commands under figure one. The first plot command deals with plotting the trajectory of the target. You can see the pointer select RTX and select RTZ here. And note that we're plotting from the initial time to the miss index. The second plot command deals with plotting the trajectory of the pursuer, and then also made two other plot commands that show the initial position of the pursuer and target. I put an X label and a Y label with a font size of 16 for display purposes. Also, I make the axes a font size of 16 and the background color of the figure is white and I add the grid. So we can go through and build up this chart individually. That's the target trajectory. There's the pursuer trajectory. Here are the initial positions of the pursuer and target. 
and then the formatting of the plot. And that's how you get figure one. I'll also note that this does kind of show an exaggerated vertical maneuver and it's all about scale actually because notice that the distance on the plot in the vertical direction corresponds to 3,000 feet but in the horizontal direction that same distance is given 40,000 feet so if we were to actually make those axes of equal perspective then you see a true perspective on the pursuer target engagement. Going down to the next figure, I plot acceleration versus time all the way up to the miss index. And we get the acceleration plot in G's versus time. Now I won't go into the details behind the forms of the curves and why we're getting what we're getting. You'll have to go back to other modules in the Missile Guidance Fundamentals. Uh, this is just focused on making the plots. And for figure three, closing velocity versus time, you saw above we computed closing velocity. We have our labels. We're setting the properties of the plot and notice here that I have the X limit and Y limit uh, hard-coded in. This is based off of this specific engagement of course. So if I were to run a different engagement with different initial conditions, this plot would probably not be on the right set of axes. I would have to either eliminate those and let MATLAB do its automatic scaling thing or select the values of X limit and Y limit that would make the plot look best. Here's the closing velocity plot where we've scaled the Y axis to capture closing velocity all the way up to intercept. The next plot is line of sight rate versus time. And you'll notice as I do these plots, I make a conversion of the variable sometimes like lambda dots in radians per second, so I'm converting to degrees per second here. It's always good to put the units in your labels so that there's no confusion about what's being plotted. Uh, again, custom X and Y limits, setting the background color to white, and there's our line of sight rate versus time. Figure 5 is a plot of range versus time over the window of 9.5 to 11 seconds. We use the semi-log y command to make a plot with a y-axis on the logarithmic scale. That's range on a logarithmic scale. This allows us to better observe that point of closest approach between the pursuer and target, what we're here calling the miss. So we're back up at the top of the script, having just looked at how these engagement plots were created. Let's now look at the first trajectory animation. Let's look closer into how this is created. So if this has a value of on, then we go into a for loop. This K index is used actually for generating a movie file, so we'll ignore that for the moment. The for loop is indexed based off of a variable DT index. DT index is the time step that we want to visualize at divided by the time step that we integrated at. 
note that those two things aren't necessarily the same. And often it's the case that the time step size of integration is much, much finer than what we want to visualize at. So this for loop starts at the initial condition, steps forward what will be 10 integration time steps at each frame, ultimately to the final index, which is either the value of this or something slightly less than that according to how the multiples of DT index work out. So to see what I mean, the value of this miss index plus DT index is 1072. So stepping forward DT index from one, the animation ends just after intercept. Intercept is at miss index, which is a value of 1064. So if we were to go one to DT index to 1064, note that we don't get to 1064, we get to 1057 because the timeline doesn't divide into integer multiples according to DT index from 1 to 1064. So we add on one more animation frame to ensure we capture the intercept. Now let's jump into the for loop itself. So at the initial time, we create the figure window and then we plot the initial points of the pursuer and target. Notice the one index. We had a title, we had labels, and then we set our axes. So font size, desired X limit, Y limit, and then there's this position property, which allows us to specify how the axes are sized and placed within the figure window. Going to the figure properties, you'll notice that we also have a position property. This allows us to size and place the figure itself in your monitor or in the screen of your computer. For every subsequent time step, we plot incremental segments of the pursuer and target trajectory. The first plot is for the target segment. It's a line joined by two points. The first point is where the target currently is, and the second point is where the target was, denoted by II minus the DT index. Same thing for the pursuer, where the pursuer is and where it was, make the line. Now because hold on is active on this plot, all those previous segments will be left. So we're essentially adding individual segments according to this DT index between where the pursuer was, between where the bodies were and where they are at the current time step. And then some axis properties. We pause for 0.1 seconds. And if we want to store a video file, then we use the get frame command. The input to get frame is the current figure. And the output is a structure that's stored into an array, F1, that's indexed according to K. So K starts at one to store the first frame. And then here, K advances by one to store the second frame, third frame, and so on. So at the end of the animation, if we have video file selected to on, then we have an array of all of these individual frames that we've previously created. After the for loop is done, if the video file is on, we have movie to AVI, a built-in MATLAB command that takes this array of frames 
and converts it to an AVI file. Here's the input, the array of frames. Here's the title of the file. And here's how many frames per second it's stored at. Now, there are other properties in movies to AVI you can check out for yourself, but this is sufficient to make an AVI file that we can watch ourselves. Now let's give you an idea of how this builds up. Setting i equal to 1. So we would go into the first conditional, make the initial plot, that's our initial frame, and the frame could be captured with get frame if we chose. Now if i were equal to the second animation time step, so that's 1 plus dt index, it's 11, then we enter the second animation time step. We enter this conditional and we plot those segments. So let's look at the target segment first. So you really can't see it. We're going to have to zoom in. And there it is. That's where it was, that's where it is, and we're just plotting those, a line connecting those two points. Pursuer, some more axis stuff, and you can barely see that pursuer trajectory now. So that's the position, there it was, there it is. In actuality, it's not a perfectly straight line, but the plot is showing it as a straight line because it connects lines between points. The true engagement would have a slight curvature over that small time step, which may or may not be visible at this scale. And so we go to the third frame of the animation. That's ii equals 1 plus 2 times dt index. And then we'll run that. So we had the first frame, the points. The second frame was the first segment with the point. And then the third frame has the point, the first segment, and the second segment. And so the process continues until the final frame. Now let's look at the second animation shown. It's turned on by the variable zoomed engagement viz. So again, going into our for loop, making a figure seven. The first thing we plot is the pursuer velocity vector. That means we get the present pursuer velocity vector. And to make an arrow, we use MATLAB's quiver function. Quiver takes the input of where the base of the vector is going to be. So that's at the position of the pursuer at the present time. And then it draws the vector according to the X and Z, or horizontal and vertical components of the vector as defined by these two values. We set the color, we set the line width, we tell the plot to hold on, and we proceed. Also, we're giving Quiver a handle. In the animation, you'll have noticed that the arrows don't hold on. The arrows are actually erased at each time step. So you see this continuous motion of the velocity vector and the acceleration command. So we need to make this handle in order to delete those arrows at each time step. So after plotting the pursuer velocity vector, we then plot the position trace as time steps forward. So this is just as was done in the previous plot. This is what's held on for the whole animation. You see that blue trail behind the pursuer. The next thing we plot is the acceleration vector. And how we compute the acceleration vector depends on whether we select a true or pure pronav. So if it's pure pronav, then we have the following formulas for the acceleration vector. And 
This scale factor eight in here, this is just something that I've manually put in. It's not part of the formula for acceleration. So our velocity is on the order of several thousand while our acceleration is on a completely different scale, potentially two orders of magnitude less than the velocity. So in order to actually see both vectors and how their sizes change, we have to scale them in a manual way. And one could have probably devise an automated way to scale these within a plot. And if you choose to do this, then that's great. But right now, this is we just have this manual scaling. We plot the range vector if it's true pronav. And the reason we plot the range vector is because I want to show that the true pronav command that's generated from, from these formulas, and again, we're scaling by eight for visualization purposes, but that true pronav command is perpendicular to the range vector. The next plot is of the pursuer acceleration vector itself. So we're using, again, MATLAB's quiver, current pursuer position, and then the acceleration components in the x and z direction. We plot the pursuer as a point itself. We do some custom plot formatting. If we wish to make a video, then we store the present frame in the array F2. And now we come to the point where we're about to make the next frame. So we need to delete things that should not be there in the next frame. If we're using true pronav, we don't want all those range vectors to hold on. That would make the plot very busy. So we delete the present range vector. And then we delete the following three plot handles, one, three, and four. So going back up, we're deleting the point that the pursuer was at, we're deleting the pursuer acceleration vector, and we're deleting the pursuer velocity vector here. Now let's step through the animation frame by frame, starting with the first frame, creates our pursuer velocity vector with the quiver. II is equal to one, so we skip this conditional onto evaluating the acceleration vector that's scaled. And also, since true pronav was selected, we have the range vector that will appear on the plot. There it is. Going down here, plot the pursuer acceleration vector. This is the scaled vector for visualization purposes. You can see the base of it right here. We plot the pursuer as a point, and then we format the plot by setting the axes appropriately so we get what we saw earlier. This is the first frame of the animation. This pause allows us to watch the animation evolve as each frame is determined. If the pause was not there, MATLAB would simply evaluate the script all the way through and we would only see a plot of the last frame. Get frame stores the current image into an array that then can later be processed into a movie or into an AVI file. Moving on to the second frame, we set our index at one plus DT index. We go back up. Evaluate the first piece. 
Now we go into this if statement and we have the trajectory segment. It's on here, you just can't see it very well because it's the same color as the velocity vector. We have our range vector and acceleration. And then we plot the rest of the frame and we see the second frame completed. Going on to the third frame, these pieces become artifacts and so they're deleted again. The third frame is updated and the plot proceeds until it's finished. Let's run this script all the way through like that. And since we set video file to on, we stored the frames with get frame and we converted that set of frames to a movie. Now we have our video stored. We can play it. Once again. These types of visualizations can be very helpful when trying to understand what's going on with the guidance law.